What is up, y'all? My name is Shelby Brooks. I'm the consenting admin chair for fall 2019 through spring 2020, and we're gonna do a little consenting video. Obviously, first thing you wanna do is get checked off to consent because we have no rules and everybody has to be checked off. This video is a great start to your training if you couldn't make the consenting video, but you need to go into someone's office hours to confirm they are eligible to consent. Okay, first things first, you need to have your checklist of things with you. So number one, you need your blood processing kit. I always bring two, because you never know if you're gonna consent more than one patient. Serum tubes, same thing, bring two. Consenter forms, I make lots of copies. They're always available at the HDB for you when you need them. Um, Hand-sewed osier bag, thank you Dr. O. Your HIPAA bag, make sure you have the lock to it. Um, pens, because they're gonna need to sign stuff. The seat and volunteer badge to get into the ED. I'm not currently wearing mine, but we have these cute little things. You guys should totally get one. Anyways, back on track. You have to have your laptop, um, preferably with red cap pulled up as soon as you walk in, just in case, you never know if they're gonna say yes. And then in your business casual clothes, which means at least jeans and a belt and preferably closed toed shoes. I'm not wearing any right now, so I'm not a good example. Also, t-shirts aren't allowed, so. Well, reminder, make sure you don't leave all of your blood processing kits or your bag in the car, because it will mess up the preservative in the blood processing stuff, and we don't need to be wasting any tubes or osier money. Let's say you get a good case, which is awesome. Make sure you go on and check, make sure the screener was correct and that is a valid case. They do have a head injury. You know, a CT is probably a really good sign that they, you know, have been tested for one and are have a possibility of one. Um, if everything lines up well and you just need to know if it's happened within the last 24 hours or if it's had a previous head injury, probably time to go in. So you're gonna walk into Dill Children's. And you're gonna go up to the nurse or the physician or the nurse practitioner on call and you're going to ask very graciously if that child has had the head injury within 23 hours, if they've had any previous head injury listed in their chart, make sure they're between the age of five and 16, and then ask them their opinion if they think it's a good candidate for our study. Usually they'll be really nice and excited and be like, oh my gosh, yes, this kid's perfect for your TBI study. A good question to ask is if they speak English or Spanish. We're getting consented on Spanish patients this semester, which is awesome, but as of right now, we're not um, able to consent Spanish patients, so stay updated with that. All right, let's say the doctor says that it's a great match for your study, which is great. Go into the patient's room and run them through your intro to confirm that they are eligible. So for a lot of you, I know the intro is kind of scary because it's like, how do you describe the entire study in like less than a minute? Well, let me show you. For the record, practice is important because I think I've videoed this spiel at least 10 times. So Allie's chief clinical officer, and so she's gonna do her spiel for me um, with me being a parent. Um, as a research volunteer um, with Dell Children's and with Dell Medical School. And I was just wondering if I could have a few minutes of your time to talk to you about a study that we're currently enrolling patients for. Sure. Um, so what we're studying is children who have had head injuries and I've heard that your um, son or daughter um, has had a head injury and may potentially be eligible for our study. Um, it's a, it's simply an observational study. Um, we won't do have any invasive procedures or doing anything like that. Um, we'll just be asking you a few questions through surveys and um, asking for a blood draw today and then a saliva sample in six months. Um, you would be compensated for your time and participation in this study. Um, you would get $25 today if you do these surveys and the blood draw. And then in three months, you'd get another $25 once you complete those set of surveys. And then in six months, you'll get another $25 and um, $25 when you send back a saliva sample. So up to $100 um, for your participation in the study and you can disenroll at any time, um, any part of the study and you keep all the money that you have um, been paid. I don't know if this might be something that you're interested in um, hearing more about. If you are, you can let me know. Very interesting. Okay, so once you do your spiel, just like Ali just did, then you're gonna make sure that you're they are a confirmed eligible patient. So make sure the patient is five to sixteen. Ask them when the time of injury was. If you know that wasn't within 23 hours, then they're not eligible. Make sure they do have a head injury. 
um, and ask them if they've ever had a head injury before. A lot of kids that come in will have come in for like soccer game injuries and they've had a previous head injury from a soccer ball, um, something like that. Even and a head injury when they were like a year old still counts. Any conditions you need to ask for, such as seizure disorders, um, any kind of severe impairment, like Down syndrome, um, Cree de Shaw, uh, any severe debilitating mental health issues, no suicidal ideations, no PTSD, bipolar, unless it has to be really severe. I think mild depression is okay. Is that right? Um, I believe so. And you just want to make sure that they're not on any medications that may um, just interfere with the study. If you're not sure, always blast the Slack and somebody can help you out. Yeah. Um, make sure they're not currently undergoing any chronic condition treatment, such as cancer, diabetes, um, hypertension, any kind of weird conditions you're like, I don't know. I would blast slack. Blast slack. That'd be the, I like that. <laughs> blast slack, 2019. <laughs> um, any kind of inflammatory condition. Arthritis, I actually have arthritis. I take them at the trexate. I would not be eligible for this study. Things like that. Um, any microcephaly, deafness, um, and as of right now, if they're Spanish speaking, we can't consent them, but by the time this video is posted, I'm hoping that we will. So you might be asking, what happens if they say no? So it seems like your um, son or daughter would be eligible for this study. Um, I don't know if that's something that you're interested in or not. Um, what do you think? I don't really think so. Um, okay, I, I completely understand and I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I'm not sure if maybe this just isn't a good time and I can come back in about 10 minutes or if there's a reason why you're not interested. Um, if you'd like to provide that information, it would help us learn a little bit more and help recruit patients for our study. I don't think my child is able to handle a blood draw right now. That's understandable. Um, I'd just like to let you know, just in case this might change your mind, now we are doing the blood draw, um, but if your child does decide to do the blood draw, it'll help children in the future um, possibly not need to do the blood draw, and we may just be able to do a saliva sample. But that's not available today, but it may help children in the future have that option. Okay, back to swing you. <laughs> that swings you? Cool. Yep. Let me get my paperwork. Okay, so right here I have um, the parental consent form, and I can either leave this with you or I can walk you through it. Um, it's a lot easier if I walk you through it and make sure that we hit um, the key points on each page, um, but it's totally up to you, whatever you prefer. Walk me through it, sounds great. Okay, so on this first page, we have a little bit of an introduction of the study. Um, like I mentioned, what we are studying children who have had head injuries, um, and just looking at their recovery, and it's a purely observation study um, and then this part right here asks I mean describes a little bit about the baseline um, surveys that you're going to complete so today you would be completing a set of surveys that ask you asks you about how your ch child was before the injury occurred um, so not after the injury but before so we do prefer that you complete the this set of surveys before you leave the hospital today um, that way it's just fresh in your mind and you can accurately answer those questions but if you feel um, like you should complete them at home, you, that is completely up to you. Um, this second page um, goes into a little bit more detail about the second set and third set of surveys that you're going to receive um, and the time period that it's going to take. It says here that it's going to take less than 90 minutes, but from my experience it doesn't take parents more than 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we do ask you that you take your time and you answer accurately, but it does not take a long time and definitely not 90 minutes. Um, the second part here uh, describes a little bit about the blood draw and the risks that um, are associated with the blood draw. Just like any um, blood draw, there's always the risk of infection that we have to acknowledge, um, but the medical staff here is highly trained and I don't think that that would happen. Um, this next part talks a little bit about the saliva collection sample um, that we ask for in six months um, and why we're asking for it. Um, that will be completely de-identified and will, will not have any information tied to your child. Um, it will be stored in a locked freezer in a locked building with a security guard. Nobody will have access to it. Um, the only person who will is Dr. Osier, the principal investigator, just in case you do decide to disenroll from the study. Um, do you have any questions so far about anything that we've gone over? No, not so far. Okay. 
So then this next part um, describes a little bit more about the surveys um, and goes into depth a little bit about them specifically and um, what they ask for. Then the next part is about the um, specimen storage, and like I mentioned, um, we do store everything in a locked in a locked freezer in a locked building with a security guard de-identified, no um, trace to your child or any of that. Um, so this page talks a little bit more about the risks involved with the study. Um, the first would be the blood draw and the risk of infection, or just getting dizzy or something like that. Any of the typical risks associated with the blood draw. Um, the next is about the saliva sample. Um, there's always the slight risk that the something would happen to your child's information, but considering all the precautions that we take, um, that is highly unlikely. And then also um, some risks about the outcome testing. If anything in the surveys that is provided to us um, indicates any form of abuse or anything like that, we would have to notify um, the proper authorities, but other than that, there's no real risk associated with that. Um, then this part here talks a little bit about the possible benefits of the study. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a completely observational study. Um, we won't be intervene intervening in your child's care, um, so in that aspect, your child won't receive any direct benefit other than the compensation um, that you will receive. Um, at this point, do you have any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, this part talks a little bit about what if your child doesn't want to participate. If your child doesn't want to participate, we will not enroll your child in the study. Um, it's very important to us to know that your child is voluntarily participating in the study. Um, it just makes for a better um, relationship between us and the patients. Um, and then this part right here is really important. Um, for you to fill out. It just asks if you would like to be contacted for future research studies. This does not mean that we're going to be soliciting your information out to people who are um, studying brain injuries. Um, an example where this might apply is to say that if our study gets funding past um, the date that we currently have funding for, we may call you back and see if you're still interested in um, participating in the extension to the study. Um, and so you can just mark off yes or no when you fill out this form. And then this part here goes over a little bit about the compensation. Um, you will be compensated for today after you complete the blood draw and the um, surveys. You will be um, sent a um, link to your email to DocuSign um, a form. And then once we receive that back, you will be given a $25 Amazon gift card. The same procedure will happen at three months and six months, and then um, at six months it would be for the surveys, $25, and then once we receive the saliva sample, another $25. Do you have any questions about the compensation or anything else we've gone over so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, as I mentioned before, this part goes over a little bit more about how your child's information will be protected. Um, Everything has no, your child's name will not be on any of the samples or on any of the forms. Everything has a, an ID just placed on it um, and those IDs are completely randomized and the only person who has access to that information is Dr. Osher. Um, this part here goes over a little bit about who you should contact if you have questions about the study or um, you, if you wish to disenroll from the study. If you wish to disenroll from the study, your best point of contact would be Dr. Osher, our PI. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they have access to the information and can then um, get rid of your samples um, appropriately and um, remove you from the study. If you have any questions about the study um, specifically or just in general, um, the best points of contact would be Dr. Osher or the IRB board, um, which is listed here, and their contact information is there. So that is about everything that this form goes over. Do you have any questions right off the bat? No. Okay, I can leave this with you, and you can go over it um, in detail um, if you'd like or if you're comfortable filling it out right now. Um, that's up to you. Explained it well, I will fill it out. Awesome, thank you so much. So once you have um, the parental consent, you have to go through the participant assent form. So go through everything with them to make it more um, childlike. It has to be on a third grade reading level. Get understandable yes. for a child.
explain what the blood draw is, highlight the fact that you're helping kids down the road. A lot of kids will be more likely to participate in the study if they know that it's going to help someone else just because they are in the hospital and being helped by other people. Make sure they know that they will get compensated. Kids love money. We love money. They like video games. They like video games. Money buys video games. Once you get parental consent and the child's essence, um, go ahead and get out the blood form, which looks like this. We're gonna go and um, make sure and fill out the, all the patient's information on that, and then um, go to the doctor. Um, they should be in the emergency department room. There's like a little office in the back, and have them sign it. It can also be signed by a nurse practitioner if they're there. Um, and then give this blood form to the nurse, and also hand her a blood kit and ask her if she will take the patient's blood. This is usually done best if the patient is currently filling out REDCap. If you need help with REDCap, there's a really awesome like how-to guide. It's linked in the air table. It should be in your consent or checklist. Um, it will guide you step-by-step step on what to click. Most people do this on their computer, like I give the patient their computer and let them fill it all out. But while they're filling out, it's best for you to do the blood processing stuff. Also gonna need to get the HIPAA form signed. Um, Allie and I usually just hand them the packet of forms to sign, and then once they're done signing all of those, then we hand them the red cap, and then we move on to asking the nurse for the blood draw. Once you have blood processing form, the consent and assent, and then the HIPAA form, you're gonna go make copies. You're gonna make two copies, actually, of the consent and assent forms, one for the patient, parent, and then one for the doctor and nurse for their files. So that's both for consent and assent forms. And then blood forms and HIPAA forms, we only need one copy of. So the original comes to us, and that one copy goes to the nurse for their chart. So that does none of those two go to the patient. Once you get all of those items and the nurse gets the blood for you, you're gonna hand the nurse a thank you card. Super, super important that you thank her for, thank she or he or they for their time and then you're gonna go take the blood and you're gonna let it clot for 30 minutes. Um, usually while the blood's clotting, um, we fill out the helper's form, so anyone that has helped you thus far, nurses, doctors, PCTs, lab tech, the security guard, whoever you called yeah. to help you. Shout outs and Slack exists. Yeah. <laughs> After you let the blood clot for 30 minutes, uh, you're gonna go to the lab at the DCMC and you're going to centrifuge. If you need a brush up on all of that, okay. there's a great blood processing video that Lo made. Shout out to Lo. Um, I'll that, link it below. Yes. You centrifuge for five minutes, that's on Lo's video. And then you're gonna pipette the serum in the cryo tubes and then place those serum cryo tubes in the research freezer box. Again, I think all of that is in Lo's video. Yes. Um, and then you're gonna fill out the post consent form. That's online. I can also post the link to that. So after you fill out the post-consent form, you're gonna to wanna to update the case and control spreadsheet. Right now we're not doing any controls, so it might seem a little different, um, but once we do, again, update that. Um, all of this is on the consenting shift checklist. All of the links to that are, and um, there's a really cool little um, QR code that you can scan to get to it, but it's also always an Airtable. Um, you're then gonna complete the consenter red cap section, such as like consenter name, EHR number, um, blood specimen log, um, all of the things that um, you didn't get whenever you were with the patient. And then you're gonna fill out postcards for the patient and the paperwork. And make sure you have it all. Like it's crucial that you have all the paperwork together. And then you're gonna drop it at the HDB in the lock box above the white cabinets. Um, once you're done and your patient has completed all of their baseline surveys, you need to email osierclinicalofficer at gmail.com. If that changes, someone in the description will change it below. The stickers, you're probably wondering what these are that are in the front of your consent packet. They're going to go on the top right corner, just don't cover words, of every different document. So one for consent, one for assent, one for HIPAA, one for blood orders. These are going to go on after you make copies because we don't want these participant ID numbers going to everyone. They only go in the originals. Ride-alongs are no longer a thing. They're called buddy ships now. Um, we're gonna have a Slack channel so that um, consenters uh, and new consenters are both on. New consenters will post whenever they're going to do their first shift and they're basically shooting out a message saying if anyone's interested in coming to me on my first shift then a then a seasoned consenter 
will sign up to go with that newbie consenter. That way it's not the other way around. So on that first shift for the newbie, whenever you have the seasoned buddy with you, the newbie will be doing the consenting and the buddy will only come in if that newbie needs help. So it's still the newbie's consenting shift. The buddy is just there as a backup um, in case the newbie struggles. First shift is also has to be a DCMC because if there are no cases, then you need to do at least one practice run through all the way through with the buddy pretending to be the patient and then go through the entire process of consenting at the hospital, like consent until post consent. Make sure you go to the hospital, to the blood processing areas and such. Okay, so if you're ending this video and you're like, oh my gosh, that was a lot, or I'm never gonna make it as a consenter, never gonna get checked off. No fear, we have a rubric now that like very clearly lays out our expectations, what you need to do, um, so that will be linked below. If you have any other questions, you're welcome to email osierlabconsent at gmail.com.